Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, going to verse 11. You ready? That's not heartening. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah let's do this. Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, where did we leave off last week? Jesus was baptized. And while he was baptized, the Father, a voice from heaven, said, This is my Son, probably bellowing, right? This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit of God descended upon him like a, uh, like a dove, right? And immediately after that, it says, Jesus was led by what? The Spirit, the same Spirit that descended upon him like a dove. That's not what the sermon's about, but oh boy, that'll preach. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Duh. <laughs> right? But just in case you were wondering, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor and glory. All this I will give to you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. May God add blessing to this, the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Man, I love that story, because I love a good smackdown. I love it, and Jesus lays it on thick to Satan. Satan shows up, he's like, hey, what about this, Jesus? Jesus is like, boom, scripture, 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 get out of here, and he's gone, right? It is amazing, and so unlike my life. Right? I know that laughter. That's nervous laughter. It's like, oh God, here we go. I wish my life was like that. When temptation comes a knocking, it, it goes a packing shortly thereafter. I wish that was the, the case. But the truth is, a lot of times, that's not my story. Several years ago, a student contacted me. He was a freshman. He said, um, wait, I need to talk, I need to talk, I need to talk. And I was like, okay, meet me at Starbucks, the other house of the Lord. Two weeks in a row we've said that now. So we go, to, I go to Starbucks, and I'm uh, over there uh, grading some papers, pretending to look serious and professorly. And this student comes up, and I, I kid you not, the kid is in a hoodie, and he, he walks up as though, like, I, I don't know, he's like hiding from someone. He like comes in, hands in the pocket, he plops down, removes the hood, and I was like, hey. He said, wait, I can't believe it. What's, what's going on? I, I haven't seen you in a while. It's a little weird that you, like, contacted me. He said, well, I, I've, I've just been, I've just been kind of messed up. I was like, what's, what's going on? It's not like you to not be around, and he just, he was looking everywhere all over the place, just anywhere but at me, and I said, hey, hey, hey what's going on? This weekend, I, um, I went out for the first time. I was like, out? Yeah, I, I went to a party. Uh, uh, like, I, it was like an off-campus party. I was like, oh, okay, all right. It was like, and, and that off-campus party, like, there was a lot of stuff going on. I just wasn't really, like, uh, and I looked at him. I said, how much did you drink? <laughs> and he was like, a lot. I was like, okay. He said, and then Friday night turned into to Saturday, and like I slept a little bit, and then Saturday I, 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 I went out again, okay? And, and, and Saturday night turned into Sunday, and, and Sunday 
I started to feel really bad. So, so I, I went back out, and I was like, whew. That is a, a bender of a weekend. And he said, I, I got so sick. I was like, yeah, 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 that happens. And he said, I just, I messed up. I messed up. And I was like, well, it's like Friday. How, how are you? He said, I've, it's been a hard week. I said, have you like been to the health center? Are you, you fine? And he finally just said, no, it's, it, I'm physically fine. But Wade, like I grew up in church. I don't do that sort of thing. Like that's not me. I just, he said, I, I, I don't know what to do. He said, I feel so stupid. I'm, I'm such a, and he said, I'm such a failure. And I'm sitting there in front of him because I'm like, oh my gosh. My heart is broken for him because I've been there. Yeah, the details may be different, but I've been in that moment before where I'm just looking at my life and I am beating myself up over whatever it was that I've done. And my bet is that you've done that at some point in your life too. We all have. So tonight, we want to talk a little bit about this, because here is one thing that I know. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, this is not on the, scre uh, on the screen, but I want you to, to hear these words to the Hebrews. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, that's you and me, Jesus shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, in case you didn't know, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That fear of death, that fear of, of failure, not measuring up, which, shoot, y'all are college students. There's a fear of not measuring up. Amen? A nervous amen. I, well, I'm there. I get it. I get it. Um, verse 17 says this, for this reason, Jesus had to be made like them fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And listen to this, this is so cool. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And then verse 18, gosh, yes, write this down. Hebrews 2.18. So if y'all got a pen, Hebrews 2.18 is so good. Because he, Jesus himself, suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Since Jesus was tempted, he's able to help those who are tempted. And you're like, well, how? And a lot of times when we read that, it's like, ooh, through the mystery power of Jesus. It's like, oh, Jesus, please help me. And the Jesus power comes in. It's like, let's do this. And that's not entirely wrong. But one of the things that Hebrews says here is that he was tempted in the same way we are. And so we return to Matthew chapter 4. Because why not read how he was tempted? If he's tempted like we were, then there's something in the temptation that we need to learn, right? You with me? All right, so James chapter 1, I know that we're kind of bouncing around a little bit, but I'm building to something. James chapter 1 says that sin has a, a specific sort of order. Sin is always born first. It begins when by our own desire, we get dragged away and enticed. And James says, and from that desire, when it is full grown, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So how does sin start? Desire, desire, desire. Now here is the thing. I am not convinced that desire is a bad thing. My bet is that you, when you think about it, desire is not a bad thing. Now, desire can sometimes drag us away and entice us, and it can lead to sin. But what if those desires are God-given? 
And when we talk about desire, we've got to go into <clears throat> some of my freshman classes. So if you've heard this before, even this week, forgive me. There are a list, a categorization of desires, some would call them needs, that every human being has. In my classes, I cannot talk about this side of things, but tonight we're going to do it. Okay? So I want to pull up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those of you that are in social sciences, psychology, or anything like that, you're going to be familiar with this. Maslow's hierarchy of needs looks like this. The idea is everyone has the base level of needs, okay? Every single human being starts at this bottom thing, physiological needs. What are physiolo physiological needs? Food, water, warmth, yeah, warmth, rest. No, it's not up there? Sex. Sex is also a physiological need, different from sexual intimacy, all right? Sexual in intimacy comes around number three. But physiologically, there are a lot of physiological needs. Now, we desire food. We desire water, warmth, rest. But we also need those things. Question, did God give you those desires? Absolutely. Yes. It's not up there. Sex, physiological need? Yes. Did God give you that desire? Yes. Genesis chapter 2, the man and the woman were naked and they were not ashamed. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Once you've got the physiological needs met, you can move to the higher need of safety and security. You don't care about safety till you got a meal, right? Here's why this is important. I think with all of these, and I'm going to go through them all in a minute, but... I, with all of these, we see Jesus' temptations. We see the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. What's the very first one? Ah, turn these stones into bread. Why? I'm not interested in stones. Also, magic tricks. Uh, what? <laughs> Jesus, is, Jesus has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he is starving. hungry, starving. He is like a Snickers commercial. Anybody ever get hung hangry? Anybody get hangry? Boy, do I get hangry. My mom, because she thinks it's cute, gave me a little like dish towel that says, you won't like me when I'm hangry. And I'm like, mom, that, that hurts. And she was like, you're a terrible person <laughs> when, when you are hungry. And I'm like, well, you didn't have to call it out and put it on my kitchen, but... Nonetheless, this very first need, Jesus is hungry, and his temptation is to turn stones into bread. Why is that an issue? Because he's satisfying his hunger apart from God. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, I've never been so hungry that I was like, that rock looks good. <laughs> but hunger isn't just about food, you know what I'm saying? Hunger is about a hunger for power, for lust, love, sexual needs. And it's me doing anything and everything to ensure that I am fulfilled in that way. How does this play out in my life? How does it play out in a lot of people's lives? Whew. It, it plays out in life when we try to turn something into something consumable. Something that shouldn't be consumed by us into something consumable. So, for instance, that person that you're like, I should never, ever, ever, ever get back together with them. <laughs> ever. You know who I'm talking about? I mean, it's not like, you know, who, who, who I'm talking about for them, it's who I'm talking about for you. <laughs> yeah. Man, I've got a roommate that needs to hear that. No, 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 this is for you. <laughs> it's on YouTube later. You can forward it to him. Sometimes we get in our mind, oh, but I can change them. That stone can become bread by the power of Jesus. <laughs> and the truth is, that's trying to put it back in our court, put, in, put it in our power. Why? Because we're hungry. Wink, wink. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we try to turn things into things that they are not to satiate our own desires. And that doesn't honor God. Man doesn't live on bread alone. 
Man doesn't live on water alone, warmth alone, rest alone, sex alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus says that, and he's like, "Uh uh-uh, not today. So uh, Satan uh, says, all right, I see you, I raise you. Let's go to the temple. Hey, look, we're dancing on a rooftop. Boom. Look at all the people, Jesus. Yes, I see them. Wouldn't it be sick if you, like, tossed yourself down and angels were like, what up, Jesus? You are, because we've lifted you. Lift his name on high. That's so cheesy, right? Y'all got to laugh at that. That's good. Uh, yeah, lighten up. Um, what's he doing here? It's this sense of belonging proven by what he can do. What's the dumbest or craziest thing you've ever done to be accepted by people? Jesus was tempted to throw himself off of a temple so that everyone in the temple courts would listen to him. You know what I'm saying? What's the dumbest thing you've ever done to be liked? You ever given in to like a fad so that you might be liked? You ever cut your hair in a certain way? You ever tried to grow facial hair in a certain way? Have you ever tried to insert whatever? Anybody ever gone to a concert that you had no interest in but pretended to like because there was a group of people? Jesus knew that that wasn't the way to gain a sense of belonging, to gain emotional hearing from people. That wasn't the way. He says, do not put the Lord your God to the test, especially when it's throwing yourself off of a building. Have you ever been tempted just for the sake of belonging to do things you wouldn't ordinarily do? like the the student that I mentioned earlier, who spent three days trying to gain a sense of belonging, and so he ended up doing all kinds of things to excess, and it really scared him. His desire wasn't bad, but the way about it was. Do you get that? His desire to belong to a group of people was God-given but it ended up endangering himself, and he felt it. He was so afraid. Which brings us to the last temptation. It doesn't seem like much of a temptation, does it? Look, Jesus, the world, all the kingdoms, worship me. It's like, this is the Bible, okay? Like, that's not going to happen. He's Jesus. You get that, right? But why is it a temptation? Because of this. Self-actualization. What is self-actualization? It is fulfilling one's potential. It is living at full capacity. And what is the capacity of Jesus? It is to save people. It is to rescue the world from its sin. Because sin doesn't make you a bad person. Sin makes you a dead person. Ooh, that's good. Sin doesn't make you a bad person. Sin makes you a dead person person, and Jesus, who also, by the way, rose from the dead, he wants to bring life to those that are dead in sin. Got it? And so, how does he do that? He's going to do that through three years, well, 33, but three years fully of teaching, and then ultimately dying on the cross and rising for the sins of all people. And here, Jesus is seeing all of the kingdoms, all of their glory, every person, every heart that is far from him because of sin that he has come to save. And Satan says, all of this I will give over to you if you bow down and worship me. What does that mean? Why is that a desire? Because Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. And what that means, that temptation means, is that there is no cross. There is no suffering. There is no need to go through that pain to self-actualize. But, he says, it is not God's way. 
That's not exactly how he says it. He says, away from me, Satan. (laughs) Shut up. Get out of here. Away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, here's the thing about it. You and I, we talked about this last week. We are loved by God. God has given us an identity, but God's also given us a purpose. Do you realize that God has given you a hope and a future, an idea that, that, that your major lasts beyond the University of Alabama, that you have an actual life meaning, and that is a God-ordained life purpose and meaning to bring the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth? You can self-actualize, and really it is God's dream actualizing You can realize God's dream, but here is the temptation. Sometimes God's dream for our lives requires effort, hard work, sacrifice, pain, and we are surrounded by shortcuts to attain that thing. Sometimes we mistake self-actualization or God's dream for us as a corner office as a position where there's power and influence and money and money and money, (laughs) and we so quickly will bow down to that thing to take a shortcut, to get a sense of self-actualization. None of us in this room would say, if Satan showed up to us, hey, bow down and worship me, okay. None of us would do that. Instead, we bow down to a lot of other things. What are you tempted to bow down to for the sake of your future, your purpose? What shortcut are you willing to take? Jesus was only about following the Father. But here's what I want you to understand. This is the thing that I try to remember every day of my life. God has given us this paradigm of desires. Sin is satisfying your God-given desires apart from God. Sin is satisfying those God-given desires apart from God. Your desires are not sinful, but satisfying them any way outside of God Absolutely is. Now, a lot of times we want to beat ourselves up, right? Boy, oh, the first 300 years of Christianity, people loved to beat themselves up. In fact, when I was a pastor several years ago in a local church, sometimes I would give a kind of difficult sermon occasionally. It's like, oh, this is good, this is bad. And sometimes people would come up to me afterwards and they'd like shake my hand. They're like, preacher, that was a good sermon. I was like, okay, well, great, what'd you like about it? You really gave it to him today, preacher. I was like, wow, wow. Uh, you, uh, man, I got, I, my wife needs to hear that one. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Please. <ugh. laughs> Just tell her about it and say that you said it, not me. I don't want to, like, be the cause of your marital strife, though. Ugh. Anyway, people loved this sort of thing. Like, and, and sometimes, it, like, you know me. You know that I'm, like I, like, I like to laugh, and I like to, like, poke fun and all this kind of stuff. And even in my sermons, I love to talk about grace. God's love. Grace, 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 grace. I love that. But sometimes there are some people. <laughs> Hi, Grace. <laughs> There are some people that love to come to church to feel bad. I don't get it. They are driven by guilt. I'm not a guy driven by guilt. Guilt makes me feel absolutely terrible. And I don't believe that guilt is the key to a sanctified life. I think that guilt is the key to behavior modification. Is that holy? Because if you can modify your behavior, why did Jesus die for you? Oh, gosh, that that was good. That wasn't in my notes. (laughs) Ah, it's like there's a Holy Spirit or something. Uh, (laughs) But you, you get what I'm saying. If you can fix the crap you're in, why did you need Jesus? So what good is the guilt that we're heaping on our shoulders? Like, I am such a failure. I am so bad. When Jesus took that punishment so you wouldn't have to. And so this boy sits across from me at Starbucks, and he's just bludgeoning himself. He says, I 
can't believe that I did this this weekend. I am such a failure. It's, it's just, I've never been like this. I'm such a failure. And I leaned in and I said, hey, you look at me. Because he was looking everywhere but me. And I said, you look me right in the eye. I said, yeah, you're right. This is not who you are. You thought I was going to say, yeah, you're a failure. <laughs> that was a pastoral care moment. Yeah, you, you failure. No. I said, you look at me. I said, this isn't who you are. This weekend, you did some stuff. God says over you, and we talked about this last week, God says over you that you are his child, dearly loved, with whom he is well pleased. And he said, I don't feel like it. And I said, because this weekend, you forgot who you were. Today, you're remembering who you are. And that changes everything. That's why that moment in like the Lion King gets us. Where Simba's like, my, my father's dead. And then like the clouds part and there's Mufasa and looks down and it's like, remember who you are. And it's like, okay. And then you return. And like that's the thing. That's the, the, the process of repentance. It's not about you saying, well, this time I'm really going to beat sin. No. Nah. It's about you remembering who you are and who God is and what God has done. Your temptation it's just about you satisfying the desires your way instead of God's way. But when you begin to satisfy those desires God's way, oh, that's life. That's joy. And that's who you were meant to be. Let's pray.